in human affairs of danger and delicacy, successful conclusion is sharply limited by hurry. So often men trip by being in a rush. If one were properly to perform a difficult and subtle act, he should first inspect the end to be achieved, and then, once he had accepted the end as desirable, he should forget it completely and concentrate solely on the means. By this method, he would not be moved to false action by anxiety or hurry or fear. That's Steinbeck from East of Eden. I'm Tyler Disney, and this is Advanced Retro Adaptics. Welcome. I want to talk about skills. Specifically, let's talk about skill acquisition. Back in episode three, I described the skill ratchet, which is where increasing skills lead to lower cost of living, which leads to more time to devote to learning new skills, leading to a place where you just don't have to spend much time earning money. You can ratchet your way to increased personal autonomy via the appropriate application of skilled activity. Ugh, what a sentence. All right, so not only are you increasing your own autonomy, you're having fun as you go, and you're making yourself a more useful potential citizen of the lifeboat flotilla, right? Let's unpack this a bit, because I left it rather simplistic in that episode. There's actually a few things going on here that we need to integrate. Let's walk through them one at a time and then put them together. Thing number one, we need to understand how fundamentally incompetent we all are. <laughs> By we, I mean, you know, 99% of people listening to this podcast, myself very much included. Uh, by incompetent, I mean that we're unable to provide for almost all of our own material needs without using money. We don't know how to provide our own shelter, our own clothes, our own food. We don't know how to get clean water. We don't know how to not poop all over our clean water, even if we did know how to get some. <laughs> We don't know how to use plants to cure a tummy ache or help a wound heal. We don't know how to set a bone. Some of us, if instructed to walk south, would not be able to do it reliably without instrumentation. Okay. Most of us know how to do one really specific thing really well, and then like two or three other things tolerably well. We call those hobbies. And then everything else we pretty much just don't know how to do. Right. So... When we need those other things done, we pay other people who do know how to do those things to do those things for us. That's what I mean by we're all basically incompetent. Most of us don't know how to unclog a toilet. We don't know how to fix an electrical issue. We don't need all these things we don't know how to do. We pay plumbers to fix our toilets. We pay contractors to build our houses and fix our leaky roofs. We pay taxes to government to pay contractors to build the infrastructure that brings drinking water and electricity into our homes. If an emergency happens and the drinking water and electricity goes out, we get in our cars and pay a hotelier to sleep in one of their rooms that still has water and electricity. And if there aren't any hotels nearby that have water and electricity, we don't know what to do about it. Go back a few generations and most of our ancestors were more competent than we are. They almost certainly could cook well, grow at least some veggies and knew how to preserve them. And they kept some animals they, that they knew how to slaughter and process. They knew how to walk in the woods and fell a tree. They knew how to keep an axe sharp and a pair of boots in good condition. They could make and fix furniture, sew, mend, fish, make moonshine. They could take a tree and turn it into a chair or a boat or a barn, right? They could fix a plow with random bits of whatever they had lying around. They just, they weren't as narrowly specialized as we are. Go back even further, like way further, or over, to the still existing hunter-gatherer cultures, and there's no aspect of those people's lives that they weren't competent at. They could walk across a continent, sail across an ocean in a canoe, find food and water and shelter, and maintain their culture and way of life. They knew how to take care of every single thing in their lives, and they were equal to just about any circumstance that the world could throw at them, except, arguably, civilization. Now, I don't say this as part of an argument that we ought to go back to the 1870s or to 10,000 BCE, right? It's just a state of fact. And we moderns are, 
objectively speaking, as measured by how many things we're capable of doing for ourselves, almost entirely incompetent. If you took one or two skills away from us, we'd be entirely reliant on the state or family and friends to see to our needs. Take away one or two skills and we're helpless. Obviously, there are advantages to this at the group level. A lot of us are very, very good at one thing, like I said. So this specialization allows us as a society to do some really amazing stuff, to get really far. Like, to the moon, literally. It's what enables us to do stuff like make vaccines in a few months, or invent solar panels, or javelin missile launchers, or audio equipment, right? But as individuals, as individuals, this way of organizing competence makes us very reliant on this complicated and increasingly fragile system that provides for our needs as long as we've got the cash. It's that as long as we've got the cash parts that the rub, isn't it? The system set up so that if you want shelter, if you want food, if you want water, if you want clothes and books and a Spotify account, you've got to learn a specialty and work about 40 hours a week for about 40 years so you can get that cash for that stuff. So this is point number one. This is thing number one. Most of us broadly incompetent except for one or two things and we have to do that one thing to get cash to pay for the stuff we need. Thing number one is, is just an objective observation, right? It's not a value judgment. As it stands, it's just a statement of fact. We'll get to subjective judgments in a moment. Thing number two is that we're all programmed to want way more stuff than we need for a good life. This is actually arguably another statement of fact. This is not a subjective judgment part here, but we just all get it wrong. Our culture, via marketing and advertising, the growth imperative, etc., is emergently and intentionally designed to get us to want more. As soon as we get that more, we want even more. This ever-receding mirage of enough is the defining feature of our lives in this society. This dynamic is often referred to as uh, the hedonic treadmill, right? You run faster and faster, but you stay in the same place from a subjective well-being perspective, the same place of vague, uneasy, discontent, and twisting aspiration that never gets fulfilled. The result of this hedonic treadmill is that we're all trapped to work a lot, forever, no matter how much money we make, because we can never make enough. As soon as we get a raise, we figure out how to spend that on more. We get a bonus, we spend it on more. We work some overtime, we spend it on more. So thing number two is a, it's a cultural blind spot to the fact that after one's basic needs are met, the best things in life are free. Put another way, after one's basic needs are met, happiness and life fulfillment are not correlated to increasing energy and materials consumption. The implication is that, of course, if we can figure out how to want less stuff, we'll need less money. All right, things are looking grim. <laughs> Point one is that we're incompetent and need to earn money for the stuff we want. And thing two is that we're programmed to want more and more stuff, so we have to keep earning money forever. All right, let's turn things around. Thing number three is a reminder that cash money isn't the only way to get things we need. We're brought up to be so deep in consumer culture that it can be kind of a shock to realize that it's possible to get certain things without the exchange of money. We're trained to always assume that money is the default solution to all of life's problems. But thing three, this point three says that you can apply skills to get stuff as well as spending money to get stuff. So for example, if you happen to have access to some dirt, and possess some gardening skill, then you can grow some tomatoes from seeds and just pick them at some point and eat them and not have to pay for them at the grocery store. It's important to stress, you have to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you know, birds will eat your tomatoes or they won't even grow or whatever, you know. I, I don't know what will happen to them because I'm currently still an incompetent tomato grower, right? If you have skills with auto mechanics, you can save thousands and thousands of dollars both by doing work yourself and also just by knowing what appropriate preventative maintenance to do and doing it. If you have some basic carpentry skills, you can save thousands by doing your own renovation or addition or backyard studio or van conversion or whole house or whatever it is you're doing. 
if you have some skill, some competence at money management, you can keep your savings safe from bad investments and high brokerage fees. All right, you get the idea. Thing number one, we're all mostly incompetent and dependent on the system to provide stuff for us in exchange for money. Thing number two, the hedonic treadmill of wanting more and more keeps us locked into working a lot. Thing number three, though, is a reminder that you can get stuff without money if you possess the skill to get it. So this leads us to thing four, which is just a synthesis of things one through three, which is the realization that if you can jump off the hedonic treadmill, realize how little you actually need to live a good life. And if you develop skills to reduce the amount of money you need to spend on the little you do need, then you just don't have to work so much. You could work part time or you could save up for a few years and quit early. Or you could work intermittently, work full time for a year or two, then take a year or two off, then go bad, however you like. Point four is that with a little bit of anti-consumer ethos and some skills, you can carve out a huge chunk of autonomy, of time freedom for yourself. Now, point four is where a lot of people who go down this path stop and they think this is the destination. Point four comes in a few different flavors, a few different subcultures, if you will. There's the fire movement, there's voluntary simplicity, there's dirtbag culture. There's more. Those are just three main ones that pop out at me. You know, point four is where you trim your budget just enough and develop just enough skills that you can figure out early retirement or part-time work or whatever and spend most of your time doing whatever it is you want to do. And that's way nicer than being burnt out and working your brains out, right? So a lot of people stop there and they think that's the end of the line because it's so much better than what they were doing before. And it's a great place to get to. It's a super liberating realization. Points one through four are well-trod territory. Thousands, if not millions of people have pulled this off in their lives. But, and, I think that's not the end of the line. I think there's a point five. I think this thing is on a roll and there's magic over the horizon. Now, heads up, this is where things get a little speculative. I'm using my imagination here a little bit to project into the future. Point five is where things get weird in a good way. Point five is when you spin up a virtuous circle, a positive feedback loop that develops into hypercompetence. All right the heck do I mean by that? If you can develop enough skills to get to point four and carve out some time freedom for yourself, however that looks like for you, one of the things you can spend your extra time on is developing further skills. Since you've got even more time in your life, you've got even more time available to build skills. So your rate of skill acquisition can, if you want it to, increase. As your skills increase, not only does your cost of living probably decrease even further if you're choosing appropriate skills, but at some point you're going to develop skills to the point that you're good enough that you know other people would pay you money to do it, or you know they do your favor, or or something like that. the The application of skill is going to generate uh, income of some form, money or otherwise, in your life. So one consequence of this virtuous cycle is that your level of autonomy becomes very durable. You have multiple sources of possible income. You have multiple sources of, of the things you need coming into your life, whether that's money or otherwise. You have multiple sources of flows of other things in your life. You could get a job doing half a dozen different things if you wanted to. You get half of your food without paying for it through gardening and relationships with people who do garden and foraging, urban or rural, and hunting or whatever else you're interested in. The specifics aren't that relevant. At the same time that your access to money is much less likely to fail, the amount of money you need still continues to drop. Also, with a high level of appropriate practical skills, you're unlikely to be negatively affected in, in, in a huge way during major disruptions. Power outage and the deer in the freezer is going to go bad? No worries, you know how to make jerky or whatever. Sewers backed up and you can't flush the toilet? That's fine. You go into the garage and bang together a bucket compost toilet in a few hours for some scrap wood you had laying around and set up a safe humanure bin in the backyard. In a car that breaks down out in the middle of nowhere? All good. Step one, don't panic. Step two, all right, let's pop the hood and see what we got here. So point five is that if you can set up this positive feedback loop, your freedom becomes much more secure than if your freedom relied totally on, say, just your brokerage accounts. 
and there are fewer environmental circumstances that could really leave you in a jam because you're just really competent. You are a person who is equal to more things that the world can throw at you. All right, so that's neat. But I think there's more than 0.5. I think there's a sixth thing. The sixth thing is that the world needs broadly competent people. By that I mean, I think that the lifeboat flotilla needs broadly competent people. Hyperspecialization has worked out pretty well for society based on metrics of GDP, technological advancement, etc. But it hasn't worked out well from the metrics of average happiness, mental health, physical health, ecosystem health, increased threat of existential risks like nuclear war, biological terrorism, and climate system collapse. Worsening global instability of climate systems, political systems, and food and resource distribution systems are baked into the pie we all have to eat over the coming decades and centuries. This means that we're going to have to increasingly take care of ourselves, I think, regardless of how much our states try to take care of us for us. The ability of states and global systems of power to look after our needs as individuals and communities of dignified humans is eroding and will erode faster and faster in fits and starts. Now, look, I'm not going to spend any time backing this up in this episode. If you've gotten this far with me, you've already done your homework on this point. If you'd like to do more homework, you know, I would say start with Nate Hagen's podcast, The Great Simplification. He breaks things down really well. And then, you know, just uh, let your spirit be your guide from there. Okay, so we're going to have to rely on ourselves more, on our own levels of competence as communities in the near future. We're going to have to more and more tend to our own sources of food, energy, water, shelter, hygiene, materials, security, entertainment, art, music, philosophy, and justice on an increasingly local scale. This loops back to point one, which is that we're all mostly incompetent, but make up for it by being specialized at one thing to participate in consumer capitalism. That's not going to work forever. Thing one is a thing that works now, and it's not going to work in the future. When? I, I don't know. Point is, can't count on it <laughs> for very much longer, right? That's a particular arrangement that's only existed for a very short amount of time in human history, and it shows no indication of being a durable, long-term arrangement. We're going to transition away from consumer capitalism to something else. No one can say for sure how our societies will be organized in 50, 100, 200 years, but smart money is not on increasing specialization and broad incompetence. And part of the problem with how things are currently set up is that since everyone is so narrowly specialized, they don't understand how and what they're doing affects what other people are doing or how it affects other places in the world. We've got this system where a bunch of specialists are running around not understanding the unintended negative side effects of them deploying their specialty on the world. Chemical engineers not understanding the effect of dumping pesticides into rivers and the downstream effects Mechanical engineers not understanding the upstream carbon footprint consequences of specifying larger pipes and ducts for low friction flow designs. So another reason to start to build broad lattice works of competency is that we can avoid this blindness to the impacts of what we do. We need people who are not just good at stuff, but are good at seeing the whole system, understanding how everything works together and can act in ways that don't create more problems than they solve. I'd like to make very clear here that I'm using the word community uh, very intentionally. The lone wolves aren't going to make it very long. You know, when I say skill up, I'm not, I don't mean like Rambo up. I do not mean Rambo up. The isolated, rugged individualists, by and large, are going to die alone, I think. So please don't mistake my position. I think that developing deep social roots throughout one's community locally and abroad is perhaps the most important thing we can be doing. I do not think buying isolated property in northern Idaho, building a bunker and never meeting your neighbors is a good idea. I think it's a massive mistake. I'll be returning to this point in more detail again and again. But for now, the point is that in order to meet the future halfway, to borrow Nate Hagen's phrase, we ought to be spending as much time as we can developing broad and appropriate practical skills. 
this is kind of good news, right? It's not like in order to meet the future, we have to learn how to do something that really sucks, right? Or is really risky. We just have to figure out how to get good at a bunch of different things. And turns out humans like getting good at stuff. It's basically the whole point of the dopamine system, which to make it really simple is like feel good endogenous drugs that motivates us to get off our asses and learn and explore and do new novel things. The process, if done right, is intrinsically enjoyable. So A, the process, if done right, should be intrinsically enjoyable. And B, the more skills we develop, the more autonomy and personal security we build for ourselves, so our lifestyles become harder to disrupt in a negative way. So even if all these really smart people are totally wrong about energy descent and someone figures out cold fusion and the future is going to be more like Star Trek than anything else, yeah, you know, that's fine. Our lives will be that much better, full of autonomy, enjoyable activities, and security. So, to recap, point one, we're all incompetent and have to earn money doing some really specialized things so we can solve our problems with money instead of ability. And thing two, consumer culture programs us to always want more so that we can never stop working no matter how much money we earn. Thing three is just a reminder that it is possible to get some stuff for less money or even no money by deploying skills or competence in those areas. Thing four puts things one through three together and says, hey, wait a minute. If I can just short circuit this hedonic treadmill by realizing how little stuff I actually need for a good life and just say enough's enough and develop some skills for the stuff I do decide I need then I don't have to work as much. I could retire early or only work part-time or intermittently. Thing five, pushing this a bit further, is the idea that if once earning a bit of time freedom, you put even more time into skill development, if you don't just stop at thing four, you can set up a positive feedback loop where you gain more skills, which leads to more competence, autonomy, and security, which leads to more time spent developing skills, etc. Right? It's a loop. By harnessing the power of this positive feedback loop, we can become extraordinarily competent people, the likes of which the world hasn't seen in a long, long time. We can only speculate what communities full of people this competent will be able to pull off. And thing six is that beyond the boundary of our own skin or family, our communities are going to need more and more competent people to help see after securing the things we need like food, energy, water, shelter, security, etc. In other words, the lifeboat flotilla can use broadly competent people. So this idea of becoming hyper-competent badasses is not a merely individualistic obsession. It also actually ought to be focused outward to other people. It ought to be woven into one's social environment. There's a bonus thing. Thing seven, it's almost an appendix or a precondition for points one through six. But point seven is that the amplifying signal of that feedback loop I talked about is the pleasure you get from getting better at doing the things you're doing. To set up this positive feedback loop, your skill development must be driven by intrinsic motivation. You've got to be stoked to do it. You find some skill to work on, some activity that requires competence and focus, and you figure out how to enjoy it. You find the process and the effort pleasurable, so you do it. Since you spend time on it, you get better, and your performance at that skill increases. Well, that feels nice too, so you do it more, so you get better, so you do it more, and on and on. This might seem trivial, but I think this point can't be overemphasized. Intrinsic motivation, and I'm going to use the word stoke for intrinsic motivation from here on out. Stoke is necessary. No stoke, no positive feedback loop. If you're motivated to develop skills for external rewards, for the money, for the trophy at the end, that will destabilize the feedback loop. The whole thing will fall apart. You'll revert back to thing four, which isn't a bad place. So, you know, that's a cool thing with this. If it takes a few tries to get the feedback loop off the ground, the failure mode is actually pretty nice. So you don't have to stress about failure, and you can focus on giving it a solid go, no matter how many goes it takes. Okay, but why is intrinsic motivation necessary? To put it bluntly, 
Stoke kicks Will Power's ass any day of the week. You don't need willpower to do something you want to do. You don't need willpower to do something you want to do. Like, duh, right? You just do it. In fact, sometimes you need to exert willpower to get yourself to stop doing something you want to do just in order to get up and pee or, you know, take the trash out or something. And because Stoke has this incredible power to keep you locked on and lovingly focused on something, your performance at it is way above anything you could achieve if you were trying to white knuckle it to grind it out. By performance, I mean both how good you are at the thing and how rapidly you learn the thing during the process of skill development, right? So Stoke can fuel tremendously rapid skill acquisition. There's a neurological and neurochemical component of all this, right? Which I'm, I'm only just starting to wrap my head around. But when you're fully engaged in activities you enjoy... The brain is doing all kinds of things with dopamine and norepinephrine and myelination and other things that I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly as well to enhance the learning process. You literally learn faster, have more insights, etc. when you're stoke driven. And this is why it's so important. But it's also important because, because I mean, the whole point of life is to do more stuff you want to do and do less stuff you don't want to do, right? Any strategy that involves doing stuff you enjoy that lights you up has got something going for it. And this requirement that you enjoy what you're doing, it's an assurance that there's no way to fail at this. If you're spending your time doing things you enjoy, then kind of no matter what happens, you're spending your time well. As long as, of course, you've got that circumstance where you're set up, you know, you get to thing four, your sort of your basic needs are met, right? And then you're doing this activity of trying to get intrinsic motivation going you're spending your time well, whatever you do. You need to enjoy the skills you develop. You need to be intrinsically motivated. You can't force this stuff. Or rather, you can try to force skill learning, but you'll burn out, and you won't get into that positive feedback loop. If you try to develop these skills, and all you're thinking about is how low your monthly expenses are going to be, or, you know, the end result, right? In other words, if you're focused on external rewards, this whole thing is going to crash and burn. Don't do stuff you don't want to do. Do stuff you want to do. This is a really important point. A lesson that, I mean, the reason I'm harping on this, right, is because this is a lesson that I'm taking a lifetime <laughs> to learn. But since I'm learning it the hard way, I'm really understanding how entirely vital it is. And so you need to enjoy not just the results of your skills. You need to enjoy doing the thing itself. Now, this is in itself a skill I've come to believe. Right. There's two sides of it. One is the skill of not letting something you are intrinsically motivated to do become corrupted by external rewards. And the other skill is how to subjectively convert things you're currently indifferent about to things that you're stoked to do. So we need to understand a few things here about intrinsic motivation, well, which will make it clear why it's so crucial to this process. We need to understand, in other words, the mechanics of stoke. They say that if you can get paid to do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. They also say, however, that depending on doing something you love to pay the bills is the quickest way to learn to hate doing that thing, to destroy your love for it. That second thing they say is worth paying attention to, I think. It's all too easy to burn out. The science of Stoke, of intrinsic motivation, gives us some clues as to why this is. You know, they've, they've done studies with children who love drawing, for example, where they started giving the kids treats as re rewards for drawing. Eventually, this made the kids draw less, actually. Their stoke literally dropped as a result of being rewarded for doing what they already enjoyed. Here's a, here's a quote from a paper from Domenico and Ryan, a paper that came out in 2014. Um, Intrinsic motivation is the spontaneous internally directed drive towards novelty and challenges with an implication for increasing one's knowledge and capacity. The important point here is that phrase internally directed, which just means that we need to have the sense that we're in control, that we're doing something because we ourselves chose freely to do it and not for any other reason. Any kind of external reward, any extrinsic source of motivation sucks the power out of intrinsic motivation because it casts doubt 
on this sense that we're acting autonomously. The implication here is that in order to maintain solid stoke, we need to protect our sense of agency over what we're doing. We need to be vigilant about allowing the corrupting influence of external rewards into our stoke-fueled activities. This is one reason why I've come to think that there is a skill, a meta skill, to chasing stoke. You know, one, one simple way to do this is just to avoid any and all external rewards. If someone offers you money for something, don't accept it. Don't throw parties after you complete some milestone on your project, because to your brain, that's an external reward. Don't use that trick where you say, if you just put in one more hour, then you'll get to have a brownie or a hot soak or whatever. That's an external reward. Be very suspicious about external rewards. If you have people in your life who give you lots of praise for doing what you're doing, stop telling them you're doing stuff. Just don't let them know about it. So they'll stop, you know, giving you an attaboy. This is kind of a limited method, right? It's, it's, it's very blunt. It's not very fine. It's maybe appropriate for a couple things, uh, but not everything. And a lot of times you, you actually want those external rewards, those yields of your labor, right? You just don't want them to corrupt your intrinsic enjoyment of the activity. This is a trick. This is one reason why having a tiny cost of living makes this process so much easier, I think. If you need to generate a lot of money just to keep food on the table, then it's impossible to not care about getting paid, right? But if your money problems are basically not a big deal, then it's easy. So doing whatever you have to do to get to point four, where you have a very small cost of living and lots of free time, means that either you don't have to generate money at all because you're totally financially independent, or you only really need to generate some money here and there, that means that the pressure's off. You can afford to spend three months doing something that doesn't get paid at all because you have savings. You can wait long stretches before generating more money, and that's fine. So if in your mind getting paid is essentially incidental to the reason for you doing the thing, just a very distant possible reality in your mind that, yeah, you need to make some money, but it's not a big deal, then I think that that's a much easier place to be in and be able to protect your activities from external rewards and burnout. So that's all a way to protect Stoke by controlling your external environment, by being a goalie, so to speak, and defending your activity from external rewards or for making the importance of external rewards much less. Another method, a more subtle method, is to control your internal environment. It turns out that our experience of external rewards and their impact on Stoke is subject to subjective cognitive control. By that, I mean that external rewards are interpreted in our minds as a positive event, and we can let our minds anticipate that event in advance, and we can let our minds go wild with celebration when that event happens. Those experiences are when the damage gets done, when we really focus on that external reward. But if we can control our minds, control our subjective response to external rewards, we can effectively turn the gain down on our experience of external rewards and minimize the damage it does to our stoke. So you get paid to do something you like. Whatever. You don't even think about it. So someone says something nice about something you did. Fine, nice, already forgot about it, don't give a shit, moving on. This is called flattening the curve of dopamine response. Ring a bell? So that's what not to focus on. But that's sort of like telling someone to not think of a purple elephant, right? You can't focus on not focusing on something. You have to focus on something else. <laughs> what should you focus on? Well, you should focus on the activity you're stoked to do. Don't think of the result. Don't think of the podium, the paycheck, the compliments. When you're not doing the thing, think about what doing the thing is like. And when you're doing the thing, let your mind be totally absorbed in what you're doing in the moment. Let the anticipation be not the reward. Let the anticipation be doing the thing. You anticipate doing the thing, the joy of, of being in the flow of whatever it is you're doing. Let the thing itself be the reward that unfolds in real time, moment after moment after moment. This is how time dilates, how you get lost in the love of the thing and how you slip into the positive feedback loop. Some people are naturally very good at this. Actually, some people are, are incapable of doing anything but this. It's like external rewards have no impact on them and they only do stuff they want to do. I envy them because I'm not wired that way. It's easy for me to get into a groove of grinding, of slogging, thinking that I need to do something for some external reason. 
And so for me, one of the reasons I've been spending so much time digging into the science of intrinsic motivation is that I need to develop the skill of stoke. One of the things I uncovered that totally blew my mind is how goals and plans might act as external rewards and thus as demotivators. Okay, remember, in order for stoke to exist, you've got to have the sense that your actions are internally directed, right? That you yourself are in control of your actions. Well, what is a plan or a goal? Five minutes after you create a goal, it's an external thing that is saying, you must go this way, right? A goal is something that says, here's the path, don't deviate it from it. Once you have a goal, you hand control over to it, which even if you're the person who created the goal five minutes ago, it becomes an, it becomes an external source of influence in your actions and thus corrupts stoke or can. The further in the future the realization of the goal is, the more it degrades stoke for reasons having to do with the dopamine response system. This, of course, made me think about what the impact of having an overall vision for my life, uh, you know, like a huge life goal is like. Or, or, or rather, what the impact is of spending a lot of time thinking about an overall vision for your life. Because that's just like having a goal that you can never achieve, right? There's, there's nothing so demotivating as anticipating the pleasure of achieving something that never comes. This is a known dynamic of the dopamine response system. There's no crash like the crash of frustrated anticipation. Imagine a life that is just one rolling, continuous frustration of desire. What would that do to a person? Of course, I don't think we should throw away visions and goals entirely, right? They're useful to get us pointed in the right direction. But once pointed in the approximate right direction, we should forget those goals as much as possible, get them as far out of our heads as we possibly can, and focus on delight-led exploration and challenge. Every once in a while, we should come up for air and check in on our goals, see where we are, see if we still like that old goal, or if, we're, or if we've learned in the meantime, you know, maybe we should change our heading a little bit because we've learned something, and reorient as necessary, and then totally forget about it again and get happily lost in the stoke. All right, there's so much more to unpack on this topic, but I'm going to leave it there for now. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for being patient. I do expect to be producing episodes more regularly here for a few months as I'm going to be in one place for a little bit longer. Um, I will give you an update on what my travel plans are, and I will explain why I am six months from home. The best way to follow along with my stuff is to subscribe to my newsletter. Go to tylerjdisney.com, scroll to the bottom of any page, and there will be a sign-up box. Creative Commons music by Jason Shaw over at audionautics.com. 